All right, welcome everyone to this LF Energy webinar on Citrine OS, if it's never been so easy to build your own CSMS. We're pr privileged to have with us today Alex Thornton of LF Energy, Tana Paris, and Christian Weissman of S44 Energy. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A button in Zoom, and at the end of the main presentation, we will address all of those questions. With that, we'll turn it over to the presenters to get started. All right. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the grand challenge of EV charging is, at least for the near future, it's always going to be compared to this. Uh, while we're eager to get away from internal combustion engines, there's a lot of beauty and simplicity of you go to the gas station, you put the nozzle into the tank, and you fill it up. And you can even pay cash if you want, right? Uh, so this is something that is reliable, it works really well, it's quick, and people can depend on it. Now, if you go to the next slide, compare that with EV charging. Wow, you have so many things that need to talk to each other with uh, a mismatch of protocols and standards with numbers and letters with them. And all of these things need to talk to each other in near real time, seamlessly, right? The EV needs to talk to the EVSC, needs to talk to the CPO, the EMSP, maybe you're roaming, so you have the roaming platform and they need to all talk to each other. And then at the end of the day, hopefully you get to charge your car. And the good news is we have all of these standards and protocols, they exist. And that's fantastic progress, but we still have significant reliability and interoperability challenges. So why is that? If you go to the next slide, please. I think it's because this is actually a software problem. We have the standards, but actually getting all of these different systems to talk to each other securely, efficiently, effectively in near real time is, is a software problem. What we have here is really a distributed communication system. So let's let's, now that we, we've established this as a software problem, go to the next slide, please. How do we build software? So get away from EVs and just think about if you're a software developer, what are the tools of the trade? How do you go ahead and actually build a software application? Well, uh, if it were me, I would say, let's start with a code editor. I would choose Visual Studio Code. Python is my language of choice. So let's pull that off the shelf. Django is a great framework for getting things done quickly. So I'll use the Django framework in Python. And then as a general purpose database, let's go with Postgres. And then you can add some of your own custom code on that, but then you need to deploy it. So, okay, let's use Docker to containerize the application. Uh, let's use Linux as the runtime within Docker. You need to orchestrate your container. So use Kubernetes for that. And then you need observability. Uh, to understand you know, if there are any bugs or performance issues as you're running your application production. And so th this is any software developer on the call, you, know, you would recognize this as pretty standard, uncontroversial. You know, maybe you would debate the, the actual selection of Python versus JavaScript versus C Sharp or something like that. Uh, but this is what you do when you're going to develop and deploy an application. And in the next slide, uh, all of these things are open source, right? This is how modern technology is built. You start with open source building blocks and then you build on top of it and customize. So what I'm highlighting here, and Don, if you go to the next slide, please, <clears throat> is any software application at all, including the one that we're having over this Zoom, is often composed of roughly 80% open source building blocks and then you layer on 20% of your own custom innovation, right? That those open source building blocks solve a lot of the lower level common challenges that everybody is going to face. And then there's plenty of space at the top for uh, for-profit entities to go and pursue their own competitive innovation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So what open source is, is it's a way of collaborating, right? Instead of pursuing all of these common problems independently, you share the burden 
of that, create a shared foundation, and then layer on your strategic value add. Next slide. And to clarify what I mean by open source, I mean, anyone can view it, anyone can modify their own version of it. And it's worth noting that only special people can modify the shared version of it, right? So this doesn't mean just anybody can walk off the street and modify the shared code. Uh, they can propose changes, but only people with special permissions can actually accept those changes. And then anyone can share this code according to the terms of the license. Next slide. So to provide some clear examples of what this means in practice, so here, here is Citrine OS. Um, this is the code. You don't need to log in to see it. It's all up on the internet, publicly available right now. So anybody can view it. Next slide. Anybody can propose a change. So um, here's you know a side-by-side -side diff of a proposed change in Citrine OS. So anybody can do this. And then next slide. And then a license, in this case, Apache 2.0, defines what you're allowed to do with it. And, and in the case of Apache 2, it's very permissive, right? So any other organization can go and take this code, use it as a building block, and build their own proprietary uh, commercial product on top of it. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. Next slide. All right, so going back to how I started, so how, how does what I described with, you know, how modern technology is built using open source building blocks, how does that fit into what I said about all of these standards? Well, open source, I think, is a great complement to standards. Next slide. In the case of standards, and, and this is something that industry has uh, decades, if not centuries of experience working together on standards, and that's a good thing, um, usually the way those work is a common problem is identified. Maybe some sort of working group is spun up to collaborate on solving that problem. And after this collaboration, what is usually the end result is a document that defines some formal standard that says, okay, this is how these components are going to communicate, or, you know, this is the frequency we're going to use for the electric grid, or you know, any other common problem that needs an aligned solution. And this works really, really well, especially for the physical world uh, where you need to define all the requirements up front and then make decisions that are going to have long lasting impacts. Uh, but in the digital world, a piece of paper doesn't actually solve the problem, right? So in the next slide, once you have that standard, you still need to interpret that standard and the challenge here is standards often have room for ambiguity, right? It's, it's nearly impossible to perfectly define how things should work. And so there's different, you know, different interpretations of that standard. And then each organization needs to go ahead and implement that standard. And this is a shame because, you know, this problem was already scoped as a, a, a common problem. And now you're having, different organizations duplicate effort of one another of just turning that standard into working code. And only then can you go layer on strategic value add. And so this is a shame. We're, we're making the problem harder on ourselves than it needs to be. And I think open source offers a path to uh, address some of these challenges. Next slide. So instead of stopping at that document, with open source, it complements that standard making process by creating a shared consistent reference implementation. And the benefits of this, I think, become pretty obvious. One, you have a consistent interpretation of what that standard means, right? No ambiguities, no gaps, just encode how this standard is interpreted. And then also you don't have that duplication of effort. You have shared investment in this common foundation and then still each organization can go build their own proprietary competitive IP on top of that shared foundation. And what, this, what, what results is significant improvements to interoperability, significantly reduced individual investments, and really just accelerating the transition to electric vehicles and anything else that depends upon these standards. Next slide. 
even better, taking it one step further, is you know taking more of an agile approach to uh, standard development, where actually the the reference implementation informs the standard and vice versa, right? Um, you know, this is really taking the best practices of software development, where it's it's nearly impossible to perfectly define the requirements of software up front, and taking this iterative approach around allows for continuous learning. Next slide. <clears throat> so earlier, I mentioned some of the building blocks of, of uh, common software development. So one thing to recognize is that open source climbs up and commoditizes the technology supply chain. Right. So at the bottom, you have something like Linux. And then on top of that, you layer Python. And then on top of that, you layer Django and further on up. And uh, you also see this in industries as well. Right. So um, in the next slide, I'll show you an example. And, and I think this is my favorite example from um, the Linux Foundation. So we have something called the Academy uh, Software Foundation. So all your favorite movies, you know, like Avatar. Uh, they all use computer generated graphics, right? And the Academy Software Foundation is actually a collaboration among all the stakeholders in the film industry where they basically realize, gosh, we're all using the same building blocks. It's silly for us to pursue this on our own. So how about we collaborate on some, some shared open source building blocks that we can all leverage uh, and it all allows us all to create better products with less investment. And so this is a really great visual example of how open source can address that shared foundational layer and still provide plenty of room for organizations to innovate and compete on top of that. All right, so that's all I have to say about open source at a high level. I uh, will turn it over to the S44 team now. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um... So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Anna Paris. I'm the director of uh, the open source program at S44 Energy, and I'm going to be uh, talking to you about the open source uh, LF Energy project, uh, Citrino S, uh, which is an API-based, um, OCPP-based charging station management system. And to start with, I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about what Alex brought up with the different protocols that exist in uh, the electric vehicle charging space. So there's a few primary players. Um, you have your electric vehicle, uh, which you plug into a charging station. Then the charging station communicates with the cloud. In the cloud, you have your charging station management system. Uh, and then your charging station management system may communicate with a backend that powers a user-facing application, uh, such as a mobile app or a dashboard app on your car. And that is powered by an e-mobility service provider. And uh, there are specific protocols that govern certain links in this chain. So for the charging station to communicate with the cloud, uh, is the OCPP or Open Charge Points Protocol. Uh, and then for charging station management systems to communicate with mobility service providers, uh, that's governed by the Open Charge Point Interface Protocol. Um, and in this diagram here, you can see uh, sort of where that fits into the big picture of how you charge your vehicle. And this also helps illustrate a little bit why uh, a protocol like OCPI is required. So since there's such a lower barrier to uh, entry to be a charge point operator in uh, electric vehicle charging than there is with gas, uh, all you need is access to the power grid and then you can install some charging stations on your property. That means there's many more operators out there than there are different gas stations. And uh, when you're using a mobile app, or the dashboard app that your car comes with uh, to search for charging stations to charge your vehicle at, uh, you don't want to be restricted and only see one or two operators. You want to see all of the operators that are in your area. Uh, and that is accomplished via business-to-business -business relationships using this OCPI protocol. In Europe, this is already very widely spread because you have situations where there's 
dozens of different operators in small geographic areas. Uh, in North America, the market is not yet as fractured, but it's heading there. And it's important that these protocols be supported uh, for that future. So um, as Alex said at the beginning, you know, people sort of expect charging a vehicle to be very similar to filling it up at the gas station, but there's many reasons why that's not the case. For one, when you're charging with electricity, you're not just charging with electricity. There's also communication over that wire. There's information uh, coming over the same wire that's charging your vehicle. So there's a constant stream of data between the vehicle and the charging station. Uh, and what type of data is going over the wire? Well, uh, it's not just a gas pump that gives a steady flow of liquid. There's a variety of things that change the needs of the vehicle and the station over time while you're charging your vehicle. So depending on the model of the vehicle, it may have uh, a different battery. Uh, the temperature and humidity can affect the rate at which it's charging, as can the current state of charge of the battery. If you're charging at 20%, Whereas if you're charging where the battery is almost full, that affects the power that can flow over the wire. And there's a constant negotiation between the station and the vehicle uh, involving changing the power in accordance with this data. In addition to that, uh, the electricity is part of a grid. So charging stations can be on a local breaker, like in a building and they may have a limit to how much power they can draw before they trip that breaker. And so the cloud may need to throttle them in order to make sure that the uh, collective group of charging stations in a building don't consume too much power and trip a breaker. This can even happen on a larger scale with uh, a municipal grid. So in a small town, maybe if everyone's using all the DCFC chargers all at once, this could cause a spike in the utility grid that could cause issues and brownouts. And so this is another thing that the cloud needs to be able to manage and possibly throttle, uh, restrict the amount of power, amount of electricity that the charging stations have access to. In addition to that, electricity can come from different sources and the rate can change minute to minute. So you may want to only charge your vehicle with electric credits from uh, solar panels or wind farms. Or you may want to wait out the most expensive electricity of the day and only charge at a slightly cheaper rate. And all of that is also negotiated um, by the cloud. In addition to all of this, charging stations, uh, by merit of not needing to be placed over a large gas tank, can go anywhere. And we've put them in places where they're far away from maintenance workers, uh, where they don't have an awning to sit in the shade. Uh, and DCFC chargers, because they power, there's so much electricity goes over the, the wire, they produce a lot of heat. And so they have fans, which produce a lot of vibration and the components and hardware wears out uh, at a steady clip. And this requires regular maintenance. So in order to catch issues uh, where your charging stations aren't in front of a gas station, but out at the end of a parking lot, the cloud needs to identify these problems and notify someone so that they can come and do maintenance on the charger. And then finally, there's some good news. It's not just that it's more complicated. There's some enhancements over the experience with gas. Uh, because there's information over the wire, you have the opportunity to do uh, authorization without any additional steps. So instead of needing to tap a credit card to start charging your vehicle, it's possible to have a system where Immediately after plugging in your vehicle, you are authorized and you start charging and nothing more needs to happen. Uh, just plug and you start charging. Um, and in addition to that, all of this data can be surfaced to the user in a mobile app or on their dashboard, meaning that they can walk away from the charging station and go have a coffee and they can still monitor everything that's happening with their vehicle. So, uh, this is a diagram that I borrowed from our sister LFE project, uh, Everest, uh, creates open source firmware for the charging station. And it illustrates one of the problems that Alex was talking about 
where just because you have an open protocol that establishes the communication layers between the parties, uh, that doesn't mean that you have just one implementation. And when you have many closed implementations, uh, the only way to make sure things will work is if you do interoperability testing. And for a complicated stack with several different players, this creates an absolute nightmare web of different interoperability tests that need to take place to make sure that everything functions with everything else. Um, and we saw this uh, in the past in other areas of technology, such as with uh, Wi-Fi standards um, that at first everyone needed to re-implement um, and later through the power of open source became essentially a non-issue because there were uh, open source implementations that people could use that no longer required all kinds of interoperability testing. And now the notion that Wi-Fi devices don't work with each other is old fashioned. And uh, the idea is that that will be the future for uh, EV charging. And this can happen uh, starting with open source implementations of these protocols that I discussed, uh, OCPP and OCPI, in order to facilitate the communication between the parties. So enter Citrino S. Uh, Citrino S um, is a project authored by S44 Energy. Uh, we launched the project in uh, October 2023, and it was adopted by um, LFE as an LFE project uh, early this year. It's originally based on the most recently published version of the Open Charge Point Protocol, uh, OCPP 201. Uh, the modules, the microservices that make up the application are written in TypeScript primarily. Um, and it currently has a front end that is powered by another open source project, an open source content management system called Directus. Uh, and we have a uh, bespoke UI in the works for Citrino S. You can get it uh, running from GitHub on your laptop in under 10 minutes and start connecting charging stations uh, via WebSocket to start running uh, charging sessions. Um, and you can do ad hoc testing with it either as a hobbyist or somebody working in an interoperability lab. Uh, it's, as Alex pointed out earlier, uh, Apache 2 l licensed, meaning that you can fork the underlying code. And if you do additional modifications to it or additions to it, uh, those additions can be your own intellectual property. We have a community Discord channel where people can ask questions and give feedback um, and discuss the future of the project. Uh, it currently has over 250 members. And later on in the presentation, I'm going to uh, give a link to our uh, foundation page for the project where you can actually get um, an invite to that channel uh, if you want to join. And I do encourage you to do so if you have interest in the project. So what does Citrino S actually do? We've talked a lot about the abstract protocols and the type of data that goes over them but there's more to it than simply recording the data that comes from the charging stations. Uh, Citrino S allows you to commission your chargers. So when you're having um, chargers installed, or if you are taking over the management of uh, already existing chargers, you can add them to Citrino S and connect them to the platform and begin managing them. Uh, they also store the authentication data needed for customers to charge at these stations. Um, whether that be for uh, closed environments like fleet charging or public environments uh, where you might have uh, profiles in applications with stored credit card data, et cetera. Uh, and once charging transactions have begun, uh, it stores this data, it uh, allows them to be remotely controlled, and it streams this transaction data uh, upstream to anything that may want to use it, such as mobile apps or data analysis. Um, the open charge point protocol has many different components to it. Citrino S has implemented all of them. Some highlights here are the advanced security features, meaning that the WebSocket connections can happen with MTLS. Uh, advanced device management, meaning that you can get, get very low level telemetry from the charging stations connected to Citrino S, including things like the current fan speed. You can get uh, the current temperature. Uh, and you can control the behavior of the charger through some logical components, uh, enabling or disabling specific types of uh, reporting or authentication. 
And also it supports the, the advanced user interface, meaning that you can push uh, text updates to the user interface of the charging station or image data to the user interface of the charging station. And also, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's smart charging use cases for load balancing or energy management and ISO 15118 powered plug and charge. <clears throat> So here's an overview of the architecture of Citrine. Um, you can see that blue circle there. Those are the charging stations. They connect to the application via WebSocket. Uh, the communication over the WebSocket is the OCPP layer. Uh, once the messages come over the WebSocket, they are dropped onto a message router. That service then puts them onto a message broker. That message broker is the backbone of the application. All messages from the charging stations go onto it and all messages to the charging stations go onto it and then are picked up by the router and put out to the charging station. Um, there's a series of different modules which can be run either as a monolith or as separate microservices uh, for scaling purposes. And they each handle different subsets of the overall functionality of um, Citrine. They persist the data to a Postgres database which then uh, is hooked into by the uh, Directus front end. Uh, Directus, as I mentioned, is another open source project. It's a content management system, and it supports customizable dashboards uh, and low code uh, work workflows that you can create dynamically to interact with upstream applications. So this design is uh, made with an eye towards being easy to extend. Uh, as Alex said, you start with the 80% open source uh, backbone, and then you are able to put your own value add on top of that to distinguish your use of the product. So uh, Citrino S is modular. You can create new modules that hook into the message broker um, and can send and receive messages just like any of the existing ones. Uh, it's API-based, so the modules themselves that currently exist support two different REST APIs. One is uh, called the Message API. Uh, it uh, allows upstream services to send OCPP messages via uh, REST um, HTTP requests to uh, the charging stations and then receive responses from those uh, in callbacks. Uh, and there's also a, a data API, which allows CRUD operations on all the data that Citrine persists. And finally, the actual structure of the code on GitHub allows for um, the libraries to be used as dependencies, such as the Citrine OS base library, which contains classes for um, validating OCPP 201 messages and building your own modules um, with the logic that's needed to hook into the message broker if you are creating that module in TypeScript. So here is an example of one case where Citrine OS was extended. Um, so Stackbox, uh, a company in Germany, um, created a payment service, which was a module that hooked into the RabbitMQ message broker. That's one of the implementations of the message broker that Citrine can use. Um, and they were able to integrate Citrine with Stripe. Uh, Stripe is a payment platform that allows for ad hoc credit card payments. Um, so this module was actually open sourced and it's now available on Citrine OS, uh, the GitHub. And it was written in Python, which showcases that although the um, core of Citrine is written in TypeScript, you can build upon it without needing to use TypeScript for your own modules. Uh, all that you need to do is be able to hook into the existing message broker to send and receive messages. Um, this module provides a web portal front end that lets users enter uh, the information about their charging station and then proceed to pay for a uh, charging transaction at that charging station. And it also supports the scan and charge feature, meaning that if enabled, when a user plugs in their vehicle, uh, a message is sent to the charging station in response that has a QR code that goes to the user interface of the charging station that then uh, the driver can scan and they will be sent to a checkout screen on Stripe in order to pay for their transaction and uh, start the flow of electricity.
Uh, as another example of how easy it is to build on top of Citrine, uh, the OCPI 2.2.1 protocol was added to Citrine OS. Um, there's uh, a repository for the modules that add this functionality. Um, they augment the existing Citrine OS modules and can be deployed alongside them. Um, and this has already been tested with Enapi. So Enapi is an example of a EV charging hub. Uh, different MSPs connect to it, different charge point operators connect to it, and this allows them all to share data, meaning that um, if the mobile app you're using has a connection to an API, you get connection to all of the charge point operators that connect to an API. And if you are a charge point operator and you have a charging network, once you connect to an API, all of the customers whose MSPs are already connected to it are now your customers as well and can charge at your charging stations. So in the near future, we are looking to get um, Citrine OS OCA certified. Uh, that's why we are creating a bespoke UI for Citrine OS. Um, and it will complement the existing Directus front end. And uh, soon there will be an open source, uh, open charge alliance certified uh, CSMS uh, in Citrine. Uh, open Charge Alliance is the organization that created and maintains the Open Charge Point protocol. Uh, so a quick overview of our upcoming um, work for Citrine OS. We're going to be expanding the protocol stack. Uh, there's a older version of OCPP, which is very commonly used still, uh, OCPP 1.6, which we'll be adding support for in the near future. Uh, before the end of this year. There's some additional white papers uh, regarding certain regulations. Um, in California, there's CTEP, which is a pricing regulation that requires OCPP adaptation. In Germany, there's ICRECT, which uh, is a, uh, a regulation on how data is reported regarding charging transactions. We'll be adding explicit support for those white papers. Um, and there will be a new version of OCPP that will need support uh, next year, 2.1. Similarly, in OCPI, there's a white paper for supporting payment terminals that authenticate via the cloud rather than a direct um, hardware integration. Those are like credit card readers, either in a podium off to the side of the station or connected to the station. We'll be supporting that type of functionality um, in the near future, as well as a newer version of OCPI, which is coming out early next year, also OCPI 3.0. And I mentioned uh, load balancing and energy management. There's actually a uh, open source or open standard uh, called OpenADR, which uh, allows communication between distributors and consumers on electrical grids. We'll be adding support for that protocol so that Citrine can act as an aggregator for charging stations and provide a flow of information between um, local grid operators and the charging stations. Um, and finally, alongside this work, we will be uh, continually improving the UI and pursuing OCA certification, not only for the core functionality, but for all of the certification profiles that are available in OCPP. Those uh, certifications have just been released. And so we hope to be among the first to be certified for them. And we will be enhancing uh, the UI with analytics and a configurable dashboard as well. So now that I've uh, gone over the, the theory and the practice of Citrine OS, um, my coworker, uh, Christian, will be doing a short demo of uh, the project. All right. So um, I think you have to release this, the screen, Thana. Then I'll take it over. Um, so the topic for today was it's never been so easy to build your own CSMS, which is what we want to do now. So in the demo, I'll basically spin up Citrine and we'll add a charger and then start a charge. So you should be seeing my IntelliJ uh, IDE right now. And I'm in the Citrine core project and I'm going to change directory into server um, and do a docker compose up. And it'll start spinning up the containers 
for the surrounding infrastructure that we need, as well as uh, the citrine container. As a side note, <clears throat> before we take a look at what's happening there, um, our structure, as Donna mentioned, is layered. So we have a base layer, a data layer, some utils, and the modules. And so the modules are kind of what you've seen earlier that are distributed, and they build on top of the other layers. It also means you can use those if you maybe only need um, the structure of the OCPP messages in your setup. Um, then you can import base. Or if you need only the data connection into the database for all the, um, for everything, then you can use data. All right. And that also means here the modules, you can split it up. So as Donna mentioned, you would in production want to split up the modules based on how much they are used. The transaction modules sees a lot of usage, so you want to scale that out easy, while some others you can batch together. For running it on my laptop, uh, we have an example um, called server where I went into, and there we have a Docker compose file that builds us all the infrastructure, as well as batches together all the modules into a single uh, Docker container. And so here we're running the entire Citrine stack um, as one, and we have our surrounding infrastructure, which is RabbitMQ, the message broker that we saw earlier. We have a Postgres database. Um, the, uh, on here, you'll see it as OCPPDB, then the Directus front-end um, UI, and our underlying Citrine project. All right, so it seems like um, it's up now. Let's take a look. And direct this is loading. And I can sign in. All right. The so here we see our directus UI, which shows us some tables that we um, pre-configured on kind of what's important. Um, one of them is our boots table, which is where we see which charging um, box is connected when, and we can add them into our network as known charging stations. Then here we basically allow charging stations, make them known into our network. And then locations is the other important one, which is placing them in our network. So let's um, add some, let's add all of that. Um, we're going to start with a charging station and it tells us, all right, so it's the ID needs to be the station ID, which is the back part of how the charging station connects. Um, we're gonna use CP001 because I know that's what our station is called that we're going to connect. The location ID isn't quite important yet. Um, we'll associate that in a second. All right, so now um, we have the station added and we're going to associate it to a location. So let's create a location. We'll call it home suite home in our city home in 94417, uh, New York, USA. And we have the charging pool. Um, well, that sounds like that's where our charging station should be. So since we created it earlier, we're just going to add it here into the pool that is associated to this location. Um, and we'll give it a name, home, and then we'll place it somewhere. Uh, I like New York, so I'm going to live right on Central Park. All right, so now we've added a station. Um, we know it in our, in Citrine, um, we can see it's not online though. All right, so back to the boots. So to allow it in, we want to have a boot notification set up here where we configure what, uh, what the retry looks like. Um, and also with OCPP 201, you have the addition that you can ask a bunch of variables from the charging station. And that's done via the boot notification um, and we can configure that here. So Thana mentioned earlier, there's lots of APIs. So 
our citrine spun up and it generated an open API spec, uh, which is here. And you can see there's lots to do. Um, for us, I already prepared it in my postman and we're going to add um, to the boots table. All right, so here we're going to send that we're going uh, that the status should be pending and that we want a base report on pending as well as when the uh, charging station is supposed to tell us it's alive and a retry interval. So this is going to be sent to Citrine to that um, API I mentioned and we'll see it indirect us. Everything went well. If we refresh, it should be there. All right, great. Last boot time, none yet, because we haven't added it to our um, to our network. So let's add the actual, or let's connect the station for the first time. For this, I'm going to use um, Everest's charging simulator. So they have a containerized version of their software stack. And there we can, uh, they use node red as the UI and we can connect and pretend we're an actual charging station like plugging in or unplugging to test our setup um, and OCPP integration. So I'm going to bring up those Docker containers and their um, application is called manager here. And then we're gonna take a look if that's ready. All right, so here's the UI, here's our charging station. The whole thing around it is basically to test some errors, but for us right now, it's most importantly to plug in or unplug. All right, let's take a look. If we um, go here, um, it must still be starting up or we should be seeing a last boot time. Um, give it a few seconds. So what we're going to do is once it's started up, we are going to add a token um, so that we can authorize the session and then we'll start the session uh, with a remote start um, from basically through Citrine all the way to the charging station. All right, charging station has booted up um, and it hopefully did the dance of getting all the, um, the base report. So, Here's a bunch of information about what the charging station has inside and what the um, what the values are. And you can see quite a few pages, which is great for us to understand when a charging station is being worn and torn. All right. And we're online, which means now we're going to add a token. So I've prepared a token that we're going to send down the wire and save it in Citrine. Um, great. Now we can start a charge uh, with this token, but first we want to plug in. All right, let's plug in. Waiting for auth. That means we should need to send a start charge. Let's send the start charge and we'll see it hopefully start charging. Great. So now it's charging and we can take a look into our transactions and we see, yay, there's a new transaction with a transaction ID on CP001. And with that, um, I'll unplug and hand it back to Thana. Beautiful. Let me uh, bring up the presentation again. Thank you so much, Christian. That was wonderful. Um, and so 
Uh, some final words. Uh, that there is the GitHub IO page at which um, you can find an introduction to the project, some documentation, and the uh, link to join our Discord. And with that, I will open it up to uh, Q and A. Thank you. Thank you all for a great presentation. Um, and just uh, for uh, the participants information, the video recording of this session, as well as the slide deck will be shared um, afterwards via email. Um, now we'll turn to Q&A. Uh, right now there's only one, so if anyone does have any questions, be sure to use that Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface and you can submit those and we will um, answer them right away for you. So the one question that we do currently have says, could you please tell me how Citrine OS can be implemented into an EV charging business? Perfect. Uh, it's an excellent question. So Citrine was designed with an eye towards being able to be used on a number of different levels. So um, as Christian showed and I mentioned, there are some dependencies, some TypeScript dependencies that you could bring into your project that could be helpful such as if you're using uh, TypeScripts, we already have logic for validating uh, OCPP 201 messages and uh, receiving those from a WebSocket. So on just a code level, you could reference the code. Uh, you can also then just use the project as it exists for a fully functioning um, OCPP 201 CSMS. As Christian just showed, it can be used to operate um, real charging stations uh, that Everest Docker container may have been uh, a simulator. However, it is the same exact software that runs on real chargers out in the field. There's uh, numerous different um, hardware uh, that runs Everest. Um, on top of that, there's been some interoperability testing already done with all of the major players in the space. And if you go to the Citrine OS GitHub, you can find a list of all the different hardware uh, that we've already tested with. Um, so you can confidently use the existing project um, to work with uh, those charging stations and probably many others that have 201 implementations that we haven't even had a chance to test with because uh, in the process of testing, we've rarely run into compatibility issues. Um, the protocol is uh, very thoroughly documented. So, um, it's likely to work right out of the box. Uh, and then finally, you can also build on top of Citrine. Um, and there are companies who like Stackbox, like S44 Energy, will create custom software on top of, of Citrine if needed for use cases more specific to um, a charging network. Wonderful. Um, there are no other open questions, but we can wait another minute in case anyone has a question they wanted to submit. All right, we have another question. What about security issues? Uh, great question. Um, so there's few different points of security when it comes to um, the, the charging stack. The first is the communication between the charging station um, and the CSMS. So that's over WebSocket. And as I mentioned, Citrine has fully implement, implemented the advanced security section of the protocol. So um, in the advanced security section of OCPP, there's three different levels of security um, referred to as security profiles one, two, and three. Um, there are increasing levels of secure. One is a HTTP basic authentication header. One is that header with TLS, server-side TLS. And then three is uh, MTLS, so both client-side and server-side certificates. And uh, Citrine is capable of um, provisioning those certificates and installing them on the charging station securely. Um, so that's the security level on the WebSocket. And then for the various APIs that can be exposed, those all have uh, tokenized authentication available. Cool. And then we have another question. 
Uh, can you comment on scalability and probability tests that you already did? Sure. So um, Citrine is designed to be horizontally scalable. Uh, the WebSocket message router that was in the architecture, um, multiple instances of that can exist at the same time and uh, consume messages from the message broker and put them on to the message broker. Um, so it's relatively simple to horizontally scale the system. Um, we are in the process of getting together some actual side-by-side -side use cases uh, to publish for load testing between Citrine and similar CSMSs. Um, but, uh, yes, so it can be horizontally scaled uh, and manage networks of, of tens of thousands of chargers. And to jump in, uh, as we saw earlier <clears throat> with the modules, those are also then horizontally scaled and the only bottle, uh, bottleneck could be a message broker, but that's also very solvable. And I think nowadays message brokers are quite capable. Yeah, so for example, in the case of uh, RabbitMQ, it can operate as a cluster and you can do many different um, parallel replicas of the cluster and it scales to tens of thousands of chargers, tens of thousands of messages on the second. Fantastic. Um, there, that was the last question that we received. So if there are no, oh, here we go. Um, what is the best way to start integrating Citrine OS into our existing platform? And do you have any references or examples to get us started? Uh, sure. So um, there's a few different ways you can go about integrating Citrine into an existing stack. So if you already have a message broker based backend, um, you can put Citrine on top of that. So the modules can go on top of your existing message brokers. If you already have a point of ingress that manages WebSocket connections, all you need to do is have an adapter that will put the WebSockets messages onto the message broker. So um, I, there's been examples that have occurred, but unfortunately I'm not allowed to talk about them. <laughs> but I can say that we've, we've seen scenarios with existing stacks where, um, so to back, move backwards a little bit, um, S44 Energy, uh, we've been making uh, custom charging software in industry for about a decade. Um, and we primarily do custom software for CPOs. So there have been cases where when people don't want to implement extensions to the open source project like Citrine OS on their own, uh, we've been there to um, help them do that or do it entirely for them. Um, and uh, so one way is if you already have an existing stack with a point of ingress and a message broker, you can simply layer Citrine on top of that. Uh, if rather you take what Citrine has wholesale and just put it behind, say, an, uh, an API, um, the message API that uh, Christian was interacting with in order to start the charge um, via Postman, that API can be used to have upstream systems integrate with Citrine and operate the chargers as well. Um, and then also you can just take Citrine as it exists as a product um, and, and have it run alongside your existing stack. Um, I guess the, the, the end is there's a lot of different ways you can integrate it. It was designed to make being as easy to integrate as possible, but you may have already. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can always join the Discord if you have specific questions uh, and we can help with that. We've uh, helped people troubleshoot using Citrine in, uh, on that Discord in production. Perfect. And then one more question. Um, could you please explain the license? You said that one business has already integrated Citrine. Do you have any more information? So the license is uh, Apache 2.0. That means that um, anyone can use Citrine. Um, they don't need to let the rest of the world know it either. So I'm, I'm not actually aware of all the cases in which the project has been used. I've heard through the grapevine that some people have started using it for interoperability testing in labs um, and that there may even be some people who are working on top of it um, behind the scenes. Um, 
Stackbox, the company that I mentioned, they made a module for Citrine and then they open sourced it, but you do not need to. So when you make your own software on top of Citrine, it is your IP and you can make the decision of whether or not to open source it. So you don't need to tell anyone if you're using it on your own uh, and what you do make on top of it, you don't need to share, but it'd be nice if you do. Um, so. Perfect. We have a couple minutes left if anyone has any final questions. All right, I don't see any coming in. So um, with that, I will once again thank all of our panelists as well as all of our attendees for listening in with us today. Um, again, we'll send an email later today once the video and slides have been up, uh, uploaded, um, just so that you can watch this on demand or review the slides in more details. Thank you all again and have a wonderful day.